Nicolas We are online, I think. Of, um, first of all, hello from Berlin and a warm welcome to all participants of the film screening Finding Sally. The screening takes place in the course of the film festival Afrikamera 2020, Urban Africa, Urban Movies, Politics and Revolution. My name is Nicola Egelhoff. I am working in the Africa division of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. For those who do not know the foundation, it is the Green Political Foundation based in Germany with offices in more than 30 countries, four of them in Africa, one in Kenya, one in Nigeria, South Africa and Senegal. We work in the field of democracy, ecological transformation, feminism and international cooperation. We have been cooperating with Africa Mara for 13 years now, and we are grateful of being part of it. This wonderful festival is a great cultural con um, gain for Berlin, and we are very happy that the whole Africa Mara team could manage to organize the complete uh, program online this year. Please find the link in the chat the website, the festival is going on until the 22nd of November. Preparing our cooperation with the festival director, Musa Sabadogo, he suggested us the film Finding Sally, and we agreed immediately because this very moving personal documentary film offers the opportunity to reflect on and discuss the developments uh, in, of the last decades in Ethiopia until the present day. The situation in Ethiopia now is very worrying and uh, you are, as you surely know, and we are talking about that later. Tonight, I have the honor to welcome Tamara David, director of the film, Fiseha Tekle, um, Amnesty International's researcher and Ulf Terlinden, director of the Heinrich Böll office in Nairobi. After a short introduction of the guests, we will screen the film and we will meet at about 8.25, 8.30 to discuss the film and the political events in Ethiopia. Have an interesting evening. I hand you over to Ulf Terlinden, who will guide us through the evening and moderate the discussion after the film. Miko. Yeah. Good evening from Nairobi and welcome to our screening. Uh, my name is Ulf Talinden. I'm the head of the office here in Nairobi, which covers Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Somalia and Somaliland, and a little bit as well, Ethiopia, as a matter of regional affairs. Um, we have two very exciting panelists this evening, the filmmaker herself, Tamara Mariam Dawit. I don't know if we can show her now, it would be nice, uh, who is joining us from Ottawa. Good evening, Tamara. And we have uh, Fisa Tekle, who is the researcher for Ethiopia and Eritrea for Amnesty International based here in Kenya. And uh, we, we are planning in our panel discussions later on uh, to provide you further insights on the uh, film, the making of the film, the background, its motivations, but also to try and situate it um, in the context of Ethiopia's history and political developments, um, some of which you will have uh, noticed in particular in the last uh, few weeks, in, uh, even in the media in Europe. And um, yeah, we, are, we really look forward to have this discussion uh, with both of them. Uh, you will have the opportunity to post your questions questions um, in writing through the Q&A element at that time. Um, and we'll try and sample some of them. Our discussion is relatively short, but we'll do our best to, uh, to pick from you the complimentary questions uh, that we will pose to our two panelists. Technical questions can be asked in the chat. 
And um, I'll let you know hereby that the discussion will start right after the film. And that means around age 25 in Europe, around 10.25 in Nairobi or Addis. And for the sake of Tamara, I'll also say at 2.30 in Ottawa. Um, if anyone else is joining us from Canada, welcome as well. So without any further ado, let's start the film. Yes, good evening to everyone. Um, welcome back to our panel. Um, I hope you've all uh, been able to watch and, and enjoy and um, embrace the film Finding Sally that we've just concluded. Um, I'm happy to welcome you now to a short uh, discussion of about 45 minutes. Maybe we'll go, go a little bit over time, uh, both with the director and author, uh, Tamara Dawit, who joins us from Canada. Um, she runs the production company Gobis Media, which produces Ethiopian film, TV, digital, and music content. Tamara is of Ethiopian, Eritrean, Ukrainian, and British ancestry, and grew up in Canada. But today, today she splits her time between Canada and Ethiopia, and she's joining us from Canada. Good evening, Tamara. Good evening. Thank you so much for, for curating this event for us. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and for joining us. And I'd also like to introduce our second panelist, um, Fisa Hatekle, who is the researcher for Ethiopia and Eritrea with Amnesty International. He has published widely on, human, on the human rights situation in Ethiopia and beyond, and has a strong interest in transi transitional justice issues, including uh, victim reparations for drug crimes. So he's familiar with the substance and the context uh, from that perspective of the setting in which the film was taking place or that it was referring to. So over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, um, we hope to provide you with some more insights into the making of the film, uh, the background and motivation uh, for the film, uh, the key themes of the film we would like to put in the context of Ethiopia's history and political developments. Um, I would like to say up front that when we planned for the screening today, uh, tension was in the air in Ethiopia, but we had no idea of the uh, devastating war between the federal government of Ethiopia and the Tigray People's Liberation Front that began on 4th of November, so just over two weeks ago. Unfortunately, this provides yet another chapter in the history of political violence in Ethiopia, and as such, we will certainly talk about it. However, with respect, to the film and its producer here today. And in order to also be clear on expectations for this rather short uh, discussion, let me also say that we will not be able to do justice to the current events in Ethiopia. Um, and we are here to discuss the film uh, and not the intricacies of the war, uh, which nevertheless, we all hope will end as soon as possible. I'm sure our discussion will refer to it though. And I'd invite you all um, to pose questions, if you like, in the Q&A section. Um, we will try to sample from these and raise them with our panel um, towards the, uh, the latter part of our discussion today. Obviously, that will have to be a bit um, in a sampling manner because um, from what I've learned, we've had about 170 people watching the film. Um, and so uh, please forgive us already if we cannot do justice to every question, but you're more than welcome to post them and we'll try to either uh, let them flow into the process or raise them specifically uh, towards the end. So with that in mind, um, I'd, start, I'd like to start with Tamara. It's your film after all. 
and we'd really like to invite you to share with us a bit more on what motivated you to make this film and under what circumstances did you shoot it? Wow, well, you know, sometimes I think of the, the film as not my film, but my family's film or, or the country's film. Um, but, you know, I think the thing that really motivated me to make a film was finding out that, um, that Sally existed and that I hadn't known about this. And then from that point, um, my grandmother being really sort of perplexed when she also realized that I didn't know about Sally. And she said to me, you know, if you don't know, this means that other young people in our family don't know about Sally. Um, and also that, you know, other young people in Ethiopia don't know because this isn't something that only affected our family. And she's really the one that encouraged me and said, you know, the story of Sally has to be documented. It has to be shared with future generations so that we can learn from our past and learn from the, the energy and hope that Sally and her peers had for the future of Ethiopia in the 1970s. So that's really what, what pushed me was my grandmother's motivation and direction. Um, I think very much, you know, the circumstances of when we were filming, um, of course, it takes a very long time to raise money for films, even longer for, for these sorts of African stories. Um, but we filmed in um, early 2018 uh, for a little under a year. So we were filming during the state of emergency. We were filming during the, the transition of prime ministers. Um, so there were certainly many um, difficulties and challenges related to that, but it also, you know, sort of reinforced the urgency for making the film and, and sharing these stories and, and pushing Ethiopians to reflect. Yes. And, um... That's if we look at, you've already talked about um, the journey of making the film. Um, and in, in another um, interview, I read that you're, you're talking about um, one of the inspirations being really to explore the secrets of your family. Um, after this journey of the film and after all these years, um, why do you think Sally's life was such a taboo for such a long time? Was it a taboo in the film in, in some sections uh, we hear that, uh, you know, you maybe have just missed it. Uh, maybe you were not there when we talked about her. Um, but um, at the same time, of course, um, it's, a, it's a long period of time and it was a discovery for you. So um, why do you think it was such a taboo for all these years? Not just from the perspective of your family, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think my family's story and, and, and their journey in relation to what happened in the Red Terror is very similar to what happened to many other families. And I think, you know, when you look at how to make a film and how to tell a story, sometimes um, an easier entry point for audiences is the story of one person, or in this case, the story of one family, um, as, a, as an opportunity to tell a wider story. And I think, you know, Sally definitely was something that was not talked about, but I don't think it was intentional. So that's why you get that reaction from my aunts, like, mm -hmm. oh, we didn't realize we didn't talk about her. Because I don't think they, you know, discuss, let's keep this secret. They weren't doing it on purpose, but it's because when you have um, painful baggage, this sort of emotional trauma from your past, you, and when you're also told for so long by, by the government that you shouldn't mourn these people, you shouldn't remember them, that it's dangerous to talk about them, it I think becomes something that you're doing subconsciously um, and that they certainly didn't intend to. I mean, I had an email from um, a distant cousin a few weeks ago who saw the film and said, oh, I didn't know the, about Sally existing either. And she was also someone who was close to the family and knew all of the family histories and all of those stories. So it's it's something I think that that is because of trauma and it certainly wasn't an intentional oversight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, on the whole, uh, despite some marked recent changes, uh, the writing of history and especially the narration of war tend to be driven by men in Ethiopia and many other places in the world. Um, your film deliberately stands out because it's exclusively narrated by women, especially the strong women in your own family. Uh, what reactions have you received to this? Do you feel that there is a movement and attraction within Ethiopian society to more strongly recognize the voices of women in public discourse? Um, 
I don't know that there, there's a movement in society, but I think that there are um, female academics, female creators like myself that are starting to, to do more of these things and to push the envelope in terms of producing content and narrative that does come from a female perspective. Um, and for me, it was something I did um, very intentionally. Um, I'm lucky that I have a family of aunts, so it gave me um, a bunch of strong, strong female characters to present the story through. But I also felt when I started studying the Red Terror that most of the memoirs, most of the narratives, uh, most of the stories are told by men and from the perspective of men, and that makes them different than the stories and memories told by women. And I really wanted to, to dig into the role of women in the revolution and the role of women in um, keeping and moving forward narratives about our families and our history. And in terms of reactions, I don't know how, to what extent the film has been seen by Ethiopians so far, but um, do you, you know, does it stand out? Do you get that particular feedback or people don't even notice so much how, how female the film is? Yeah, I mean, I've only had one comment, I think, from, from someone in, in North America that said, you know, I wanted to know more about Sally's husband, um, or I wanted to know more about your grandfather. And I think, you know, both of them could, could have their own film and have enough of a story to also do that, but that wasn't necessarily um, the point of this film. Um, so maybe that's something down the road in the future. But I think, you know, the, the response and commentary from Ethiopians has been not focused on the female angle, but more focused on seeing themselves reflected on screen, sharing their own stories and speaking for themselves. Um, and also a lot of messages certainly about people saying they've watched the film and then gone back to talk to their children or to talk to their elders and to start a sort of intergenerational dialogue in, in households about their own family's experiences. Mm -hmm. And to what extent has the film been seen and shown in Ethiopia to date? So the film aired um, a little over a week ago on Al Jazeera English, not the full film that all of you just watched, but the TV hour cut down. Um, and that actually was the first screening in Ethiopia. And then we're in the final stages of preparing the Amharic language version of the film so that that can broadcast in Ethiopia and reach larger audiences. And then um, once we're in a safer situation post COVID, when we can actually start to do screenings and discussions like this, what we're doing right now in person in Ethiopia, that will be um, for me a big part of, of releasing the film there and having conversations around it. Great. Um, I'd love to bring in Fiseha now. Um, I don't know if we can see him. Fisa? Yes, I'm here. You are here. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Golfaria. Thank you for th thank you for joining us from Nairobi. Uh, once again, Fisa is working with Amnesty International and is an expert on expert on human rights. And um, I would just like to uh, try to take some perspectives or glean into the discussion on how the film con uh, sits in the current context and uh, look at it a bit more from, from today's perspective as well, or making the linkage. Um, let me say for, for decades now, Ethiopia's divisions have largely been portrayed and reinforced in ethnic terms. And the story of Sally's life centers on a different type of struggle. And to some extent, that struggle runs counter to the ethnic narrative. Um, both by descent and upbringing as well, Sally's life seemed characterized by privilege and opportunity until she joined the student movement and ultimately the EPRP, uh, which was a communist, pan-Ethiopian, anti-feudal liberation force. How does or doesn't that resonate or would it resonate with today's youth, uh, which has been at the forefront of mass protests uh, several years ago and is heavily politicized nowadays. Mm, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would like to avoid this dichotomy between uh, the movements uh, in 1970s and uh, the current movements that have uh, some history back to even 
the 70s. But the difference, uh, much of the difference lies in the emphasis. The 1974 revolution against the uh, federal administration uh, was catalyzed by huge surge of uh, fuel prices, uh, federalistic rural land ownership, and uh, famine. Uh, and most of the actors were uh, students uh, and urban workers uh, uh, unions uh, were the pioneers of those uh, uprisings that toppled uh, the monarchy in 1974. And uh, <clears throat> the movement of the protest in the 1970s uh, were very disorganized. Uh, and due to that disorganization, uh, the military and the police, which were better disciplined and organized, uh, were the ones who took that opportunity to fill the power vacuum uh, due to the uh, nationwide uh, riots. Uh, but that does not mean that 1970s was immune from uh, ethnic uh, uh, politics. Uh, self-determination uh, and also uh, identity, uh, questions of identity uh, went back to this period. Uh, for instance, uh, TPLF, uh, the Tigray People Liberation Front, uh, hails from 1970s. The Oromo Liberation Front uh, is not a new phenomenon that came in 1991. It, went, it goes back to uh, 1970s. Uh, EPLF, uh, now the current uh, ruling party in Eritrea, the Eritrean People Liberation Front, uh, it started uh, its struggle. Uh, well, it's not only EPLF, but other also other uh, members. They started uh, uh, their movement and uh, uh, fighting in 1970s and some of them in 60s. So there was this mishmash of uh, 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 cause uh, uh, and principle driven struggles like the like the case of Sally uh, but there are there were also uh, some instances of uh, this identity driven uh, movements uh, and actually uh, the political groups organized around ethnicity uh, were the ones that managed to topple the their government in 1991 it's not the EPRP or others who toppled uh, that, that government. Uh, similarly, if you really look at the current uh, movements, uh, years of suppression, political and uh, economic marginalization, uh, and injustice uh, led to sustained resistance uh, uh, activism uh, that reached its epic in, 19, in 2015 and uh, up to, to the 20, 20, uh, 2018. So uh, if that movement was rallying around uh, ethnicity, but at the same time, uh, the driving force was about equality, uh, injustice, and political marginalization. So there is this mishmash and commonality among these movements, even if uh, the emphasis might vary from one period to another. Yes, um, thank you for this. I'm, uh, at the same time, I still wonder, I would love to know how you feel that um, a, a, a pan-Ethiopian cause would be reflected upon from his youth. Um, but maybe let's can kind of talk a bit about um, uh, the Red Terror um, and how it, how it uh, sits in a continuum of, of human rights issues and problems over a long period of time. By the way, we have a lot of questions pouring in here, so we'll have plenty to talk about. Um, the Red Terror marks a particularly grim chapter of Ethiopians rights, Ethiopia's human rights uh, record, uh, but the, the fundamentals, maybe we can argue the, the extent, but the fundamental uh, challenges of arbitrary arrest 
torture, disappearances, extrajudicial things have continued to mark the political situation for a long time after. Um, why do you believe uh, it is so difficult for the country to break free from this stream of political violence? Yeah, um, the, well, uh, uh, Ethiopia has never seen uh, any democratic and uh, uh, administration and, uh, and administration which is free, uh, free from human rights violations. And uh, well, the extent, as you have said, might be argued uh, which one is better, which one is made not better. Uh, but in terms of uh, atrocity crimes uh, or crimes of mass scale, uh, none of those uh, are immune from that, including the monarchy, including the Dirk, or the EPRDF that opened the Dirk in 1991. Uh, and now, uh, uh, despite all the reforms uh, that started in uh, 2018, uh, for instance, Zadar came to power in the name of socialism uh, and it committed uh, the seventh large, I mean, the seventh largest mass atrocity in, in the world in the uh, 19th century. So, uh, ranked uh, among uh, the, it ranks the seventh among the atrocity crimes committed in, uh, uh, in the century. And uh, according to the Red Terror Martyrs uh, Memorial Museum, uh, the Red Terror was a modern day Holocaust. So yeah, it, it can uh, be considered as, uh, as, uh, uh, as equivalent to the Holocaust we have seen in the, uh, in the, during the Second World War. And let's come to 1991, the Derek time, and we have similar uh, patterns of crimes, uh, um, atrocity crimes committed in 1991 uh, or after 1991. Uh, actually, uh, maybe given the length of the period, uh, we have seen that kind of human rights violations in many parts of the country, Oromia, Addis Ababa, Amhara, uh, Gambela, and uh, Somalia. So uh, extrajudicial executions, uh, torture, and uh, similar as other, other treatments, uh, <clears throat> uh, and also uh, enforced disappearance were very common. Uh, and uh, in 90, uh, uh, in 2015, uh, that was uh, 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 there was this mass uh, protest that toppled this government because of. Well, the injustice. But what Dirk, uh, what the EPRDF has started uh, uh, in, uh, in response to the Red Terror was that only the focus on prosecution. It failed to address uh, the uh, holistic uh, justice element of both uh, uh, the victims, the survivors, and the need to heal for the community. So there was some kind of justice, which is retributive, uh, retributive heavy, uh, but other justice needs of the survivors and victims was forgotten. And now uh, we are in reform uh, since uh, uh, April 2018. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, 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 human rights violations. Uh, last May this year, we have documented uh, uh, some uh, 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 human rights violations, not so across the country, but in Oromia and Amhara, which can, uh, which can be considered as serious human rights violations. And last week, uh, 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 what we have reported in uh, Tigray Maikara can amount to uh, a serious human rights violation, punishable in international law. So uh, what we can see in Ethiopia is that uh, the cycle of violence was not, uh, we were not able to break that cycle of violence. One, lack of uh, uh, commitment to transnational justice, lack of commitment to arrest the past, and the past is always catching up with the, uh, with the future or the, 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 the current situation. 
uh, let me stop here and uh, maybe I can go back to the details later. Thank you, Fisaha. Um, I feel like um, it would be good to come back to Tamara um, because we've, we've had a lot of questions also from the, from the audience. Um, and I think maybe uh, taking off from the issue of, of human rights um, specifically, um, do you have the impression today that there is a reflection and a processing of the Red Terror um, in Ethiopian society? And has something changed in the way people speak about that time uh, between the time when you started filming and today? Mm. No, I mean, I haven't noticed any any change since since 2018 when we when we started filming or since the film's release. I think the the bigger indication of change I noticed, um, especially within my own family, um, was when the the Red Terror Memorial Museum was opened in Ethiopia, um, in in Addis, and that sort of became a place where people could go and reflect. And that was sort of a um, perhaps proclamation from the government because you know the government is a partner in that museum that we can now reflect and talk about the past and I found more people started talking about it started publishing memoirs um, and talking about it more freely in Ethiopia um, for me after that museum was opened about a, a decade ago however um, I mean I don't know what what uh, FISA would have to say about this but I mean I used a lot of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch reports um, and, and talk to people working in those organizations when I was researching and making the films. And um, one of the people I interviewed from Human Rights Watch said to me that, you know, Ethiopians still today, and this was in, you know, 2018, 2017, you know, still today, they don't want to talk about what happened to them during the Red Terror. They're still uncomfortable to share about that. Um, but they're much more willing than ever before to talk about the human rights abuses happening now um, in the present day. Um, and these are people that have experienced, you know, these issues in, in both periods under both regimes, but for something there's still this baggage about being hesitant to share about the red terror, but certainly people are becoming more vocal and more willing to talk about abuses happening now and in recent years. Lisa, do you want to come in on this? Hello? You have to unmute your mic, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I, well, I, I'm not sure uh, how this, this historically reflects people not talking about the past, but talking about the present. Uh, yeah, I, I, I cannot comment on that. But do you feel that um, Let's just say there was another question here that relates to it, that mm -hmm. um, there is a space in Ethiopia for telling, sharing, documenting uh, stories and, and experiences um, of activists like Sally. I know activist is a very tricky word in Ethiopia today, but uh, so remove that please from the question. Mm -hmm. um, the history of, of people who have had um, um, led a life uh, like Sally in in a struggle and um, confronted with um, the kind of uh, uh, repressions that uh, she, she underwent at the time that she struggled against. I mean, is there any civil society project in Ethiopia, for example, to, uh, to talk about it, to share, to document um, both the history of human rights abuses, but also um, the struggle of, of those who try to make a difference? Mm. Uh, I, I haven't found yeah. anyone, anyone doing that work. Um, I mean, I even approached the, the universities in, in Ethiopia when I was starting this project to look for academics studying the Red Terror. And, you know, the Dean of History said, we don't study that period. We talk about history, we study 500,000 years ago. That's, that's the history we look at from, from the university's perspective. So I think that's quite telling also in... Um, what is deemed as important and what is deemed as important to reflect on. So for me, really the only institution that looks at this period is, is the Red Terror Museum, but you know, they don't have a lot of money um, to do that. Their, their archive is not that big. Their exhibit hasn't really evolved or been able to grow since they opened. But one of the things 
I'm really interested in, in doing um, with, with the film and with the extension of the film is to, to document other stories and other memories from the Red Terror because there are so many other families, other individuals that you know are getting older, that we're at risk of losing them and we need to record their stories and their memories. So that for me is really the next big project that I'm gonna be doing. Um, once it's safe to, to be gathering and to be filming people in all, in all corners of the world to to archive that that missing part of the red terror. Yes, uh, I mean there are so many organizations which have such mandates, uh, uh, basically. Uh, uh, for instance, we can talk about the special prosecutor uh, uh, office the SPO that's. Uh, uh, was responsible for the prosecution of the Derg officials, uh, not only in relation to the Red Terror, but also subsequent crimes committed in the context of conflicts uh, uh, and whatever. Uh, but what, uh, what is really astonishing is that even the judgment is not available publicly. Uh, the judgment against the higher officials, uh, that, uh, uh, and also the evidence is collected. Uh, and we don't know how many cases were there. Uh, I, I remember uh, it's not only in Addis that those uh, prosecutions were ongoing uh, in Awasa, in, uh, in Adama, uh, and also other major places. Uh, uh, the officials of Sudan were prosecuted. Uh, some of them were, uh, uh, were convicted. But in spite of that, uh, the, the, that collection was not uh, publicly available. And that should have been a very good uh, teaching material, not only for law school students, but also uh, for historians and uh, for anthropologists who, can, uh, uh, who are uh, really interested in this. Uh, so that's one thing uh, which is missing, uh, especially from the time of the special prosecutor's uh, office time. Uh, well, there were a number of, uh, in three cases, because of the funding, all the politics within that uh, uh, office. Uh, so, well, I don't want to go into the detail of that, what caused that and uh, what was the expectation, who withdrew. There were a number of uh, uh, back end calls about that. Uh, and mm, right now, uh, uh, there is a national uh, 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 reconciliation commission uh, established in uh, uh, 2019, uh, by the beginning of the 2019 or uh, at the end of 2018. Uh, well, it's almost two years uh, since that institution has been established. Uh, well, a number of problems have it, uh, uh, are there in that institution, including the way the proclamation was adopted, uh, the way the commissioners uh, were appointed, it was not participatory. Uh, the victims were not even aware of uh, uh, what that commission was or what the mandate is. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, 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 vague, uh, vagueness around that commission. Whatever the case, uh, it has already been there for some time, but we have not seen any initiative. Uh, actually, uh, it does, the mandate, the temporal mandate of that commission is not limited. They can go back to 150 years or 200 years if they, if they think that they have the capacity. They can go back to the time of the red terror and document all those judgments, all those evidence, and they could have used them uh, for truth and reconciliation purpose. So uh, the institutions are there, governmental and non-governmental, uh, but uh, in practice, uh, the, the, the work is not done. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that, if I may ask? And from what I've heard, you, you spoke mostly about um, two institutions that I would uh, assume are in the government domain. Is in civil society, is there the space? Would there be the, the readiness to engage around these topics? Um, or is it simply a matter of capacity and funding? Where, where are the bottlenecks? Well, we, uh, one is that transitional justice is a very complex concept. And uh, many people would like to avoid that because 
it needs a heavy investment uh, expertise and also it is not a one year or two year project but it's supposed to be a very uh, take a very extended period and well there are some experiences from other countries where uh, uh, CSOs took the initiative to uh, to document to archive uh, these uh, kinds of atrocity crimes. Uh, this, there is a case of the uh, Morocco Alternative Trans Transitional Justice Institute, uh, which is like a shadow institute uh, while the government one was not working. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, uh, the understanding of transitional justice is really uh, there in Ethiopia. If the government has managed to get it wrong to this extent, uh, <laughs> uh, how would it go wrong for CSOs? Uh, and also, not only, I mean, when I say CSO, I am including the uh, academia, uh, especially the Disabled uh, University uh, Center for Human Rights, who have a lot of experts in this area, but uh, it has not happened. Uh, I mean, we have not seen that much movement from them in the last two years, too. So uh, it's about motivation, I think. Uh, uh, and also, uh, the, I mean, the civil society in Ethiopia, sometimes they also look at the government. Oh, is this in line with the government? So, so they don't want to, uh, uh, they don't want to go against the government or if they think that, uh, the government is not pro the idea. They, they might not be encouraged. So yeah, yeah, those might be some of the problems. Thank you, um, Tamara. Uh, you recently retweeted a line. I looked at your Twitter account and I read uh, a quote from someone. The only thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Um, we've already talked a little bit about justice and human rights, um, for sure not an issue that we can exhaust here, but um, there and in other areas, what lessons need to be learned to avoid a repeat of the past or to break out of the, side, of the cycle of political violence? Yeah, I mean, I think I don't remember who who tweeted that, but uh, it was it was in reaction to someone who had watched the film and I think, you know, Oftentimes, Ethiopia seems like a country that's, that's driving forward sort of at a high speed on the highway, but has never looked in the rearview mirror at what's, you know, what's come in the past and, and how can we learn from that and reflect on that. And I think um, there's a lot of opportunity that's, that's missed for me in terms of critical thinking, in terms of even, you know, studying history in school and studying recent history and understanding those things. Um, and for me, that was a big, you know, driving force in in making this film and wanting to tell the story and wanting to to share the film um, with audiences in Ethiopia is to really think about what can we learn, um, not just from a human rights perspective, from how how we function as families, from how we function as communities, from you know what do we want out of the ideas of of nationhood and what have our predecessors and previous generations thought and felt about those things and how can we move forward in a way where we're not repeating our same mistakes. So that for me has always been, been the driving force of the conversation and, and the rationale for making the film. Yes. Um, I will have, I'll already say that a little bit to our audience. I, there are a few more questions specifically around the film. I think we take them a bit more towards the end so that we can um, uh, close out with a, with a political angle first. Um, I, th I think we've talked, we often talk about the challenges, the problems, the, um, all the depressing aspects um, uh, of, of, and we talked about the war in the beginning. Um, I, I would like to throw a light on what needs to happen to change this reality. And I wanted to ask Fisaha first, um, where do you see entry points within Ethiopian society and within Ethiopian culture to achieve or to steer the country towards achieving transitional justice, um, reconciliation and healing? Not so much from the angle of, you know, is the space there, are people comfortable? 
uh, and so on. But uh, the value systems, uh, the beliefs, the traditions, um, other aspects of, of society and culture that you can think of um, that could provide an entry point um, uh, to achieving transitional justice and healing. Uh, Ethiopia is a very diverse country and with a lot of uh, uh, huge, pot huge potential in terms of uh, transitional justice, uh, uh, the reconciliation, uh, religion, and also uh, the social uh, interaction. Uh, there is a huge, huge potential that, 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 that I remember on my uh, 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 law school, it, it, it had been legal history, where we studied uh, the cultures of different uh, ethnicities uh, about criminal law, about uh, family law and everything. But uh, what is uh, common in all this is uh, justice uh, uh, is the central uh, element of the Ethiopian culture, most of the cultures, they have the institutions, uh, the, the means of settlement, uh, and also the rewards and the process might vary, but justice is the center of the culture in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, reconciliation is equally valued. Uh, there are cultural institutions uh, who were in instru instrumental in providing uh, justice. So uh, if we scratch the, the surface uh, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, the institutions are there. It's, it's not, uh, it is available. Uh, uh, the Shimkelen as the elder system, uh, the, and also other institutions in different cultures are there. So, uh, uh, we, we can we can have our own. I mean, in Ethiopia, we can have our own uh, uh, mechanism in order to cope with uh, 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 the past and the deficit of justice. But uh, they they have never been activated like what we have seen in other countries like uh, uh, Rwanda. The, they used the local culture, the local uh, values to, to cope up with the deficit of justice after uh, the genocide in Rwanda. And uh, so we could have done that, but that was, that was untapped potential and that should have been an instrumental in that. One thing which I want to emphasize is that uh, transitional justice cannot address all the justice uh, problems in the country. It's a combination of uh, rehabilitative justice uh, and also future looking. So in this process, uh, you cannot address like each and every crime or human rights violation that happened at every corner of the country. But that gap can be filled by this uh, traditional uh, 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 dispute resolution mechanisms. Well, there, there are some inherent problems in these traditional uh, justice uh, mechanisms, especially in terms of gender, uh, but that can be fixed very easily. And uh, so there is always a potential to mix it with the modern mechanisms. Thank you. Um, taking up from there, the role of a filmmaker in this context, uh, Tamara, what, what can creatives contribute to this for Ethiopia to access um, maybe the, the, the mechanisms and the potential that are um, inherent and available within society um, towards justice, towards reconciliation? Um, what are promising approaches for impact? Of course, we have all watched your film and uh, that, that is definitely an inroad. But I, I would like if you can reflect a little bit more on the role of creatives in this context. Um, and maybe you could say specifically whether you feel they enjoy more or less freedoms, whether they still have to be more cautious or less cautious. What is the, the creative space that is available? Is, that, is it of advantage if you want to do something about this and you are in the creative uh, industry, let me call it that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think on one hand, there's a great um, responsibility I feel that creators have and, and should have to be to be the individuals that are really holding a mirror up to society and, and looking back at the varieties of reflections that come back, whether you're a filmmaker, a musician, a visual artist, an author. Um, I think that's the great opportunity and the power that creatives have is to ask questions and, and to shine a light on some of the things that maybe don't always get spoken about um, in daylight or in, in public conversation. But I think also in Ethiopia, um, creatives often are existing in, in a difficult space for a number, a number of reasons. I mean, there were a number of questions in the chat, which I was trying to answer about how the film was financed. The film was financed completely in Canada because there is no private or state uh, funding systems in Ethiopia for the arts to, to support creators. Um, and it's off, off, also often not safe to, to be a filmmaker, to be an author, making content that is encouraging people to think critically, that is reflecting on perhaps a different view of the past or a different view of, of contemporary things in Ethiopia that may be um, outside of, of the narrative that the government wants to portray to the world or portray to people in Ethiopia. Um, and I think specifically with filmmakers, that's perhaps most evident that, you know, I work with a lot of other Ethiopian writer directors, but for the most part, they're not making films about social justice. They're not making films about human rights issues um, because it's not safe for them and they don't feel that they're comfortable to be doing that. Um, and I think, you know, right now and for the last, you know, many, many decades in Ethiopia, we've had governments in, in power that really do view filmmakers as journalists. And I think there is um, a significant difference. Yes, some journalists make films, but filmmakers are also doing many different things than, than you know, doing news reportage. Um, but until there is a change that, you know, the government can see the distinction between those two groups, it does make it difficult for many people to create art. Very interesting. Um, let me ask you um, also in terms of um, reach or, or impact, um, I would imagine that your film will mostly be um, consumed for the time being in the major urban centers, especially in Addis Ababa. Do you have any plans of, of going beyond that and what are the means for that? Is it possible? Um, Addis is now what, four or five million out of 110 and counting? Where, where is the, where's the, the influence that you can have, especially with a modern media, uh, like a film, uh, to, to, to reach into a broader society? Yeah, I mean, it's really, really important, I think. Um, I mean, that's why the, the film is in, in English, because my aunts can communicate better in English. Um, and that luckily made it easier to finance the film in Canada, but you know, the film is being dubbed into Amharic. Um, it's gonna be dubbed, dubbed into Oromifa and hopefully other languages as well, because I think it's important to make it accessible. And part of what I'm doing now is fundraising so that we can have a roadshow and go out to communities in Ethiopia outside of Addis and other major cities that don't have cinemas. Um, because those are the people who I also want to screen the film for and have conversations with. And, you know, a significant portion of the film was also shot in Mekele, in Adagrat, in the Asimba Mountain region. And we want to go back specifically to those communities and screen the film for them. Um, all of the, the actors from the, the university theater department in Adagrat, um, we want to go back and show them the film because they worked on the film and they contributed to it as well. Well, I think you're still muted. Sorry, um, my scribbling was too noisy before. Sorry, um, I think you have already um, touched on one question that came from our audience about uh, uh, the language and um, um, you know, that was one of the, the, the pending questions there um, that your, your aunties were more comfortable um, speaking in English. Um, and you've already also said that it will be dubbed. Um, so I think that's a, that's a, that will be a good basis for the, the rollout in the country. Um, someone else asked here, um, Teza by the filmmaker uh, Haile Gerima is the only movie about the Red Terror in Ethiopia that he or she has seen before. 
Um, was this an inspiration for your own film? Um, yeah, I mean, so Teza is really the only narrative film on the Red Terror that, that reached international audiences. Um, there's another narrative film that came out in Ethiopia a few years ago by a filmmaker named a Abraham, um, which, is, which is an adaptation of a book about a, a soccer coach and members of his soccer team who were members of the EPRP. Um, I believe the English title of that film is I Won't Bear More. And then there's also an American documentary called Deluge, which came out in the late 1990s. So those are really the only films on, on the Red Tear. And for the most part, although Deluge is also directed by a woman, uh, all of those films talk about the Red Tear from the perspective of men. Um, so it's not that they were an inspiration, but they were sort of really a, a reinforcement of why um, I wanted to do something a little bit different, different in terms of who we were hearing these stories from. Mm -hmm. and then we have here a question of um, whether the families of other missing or killed activists um, have talked to you about their loss and whether you've had the opportunity to have that perspective. Oh. as you made the film. Yeah, I mean, um, the only person you really see in the film outside of my family is, is Fakarta, but certainly I spoke to many, many uh, of the, the, the members of the EPRP, those who are still in the organization and those who were in the past, um, and many other families who who lost relatives during the Red Tear. And that's something that, you know, these screenings are enabling me to connect with more people because those are the people that I want to go back with and, and record their stories as well. So for me, that's um, an important part of the work. Um, thank you. Someone else, I'm, I'm sorry, I only got the questions without the name. So I never know who asked, maybe that's better. Um, someone else asked uh, whether you think that Sally and her comrades would, what they would think of today's Ethiopia, would they still believe that what they lived and fought and ultimately died for was worth fighting for? Um, what, what would Sally think or what would her comrades think? Both. Both. I mean, I, I asked all of my aunts, you know, what do you think Sally would be doing today? What would she think about Ethiopia today? And, you know, it's interesting. Um, they all remember her differently. It's sort of like, like peeling an onion. There's different layers and each aunt sort of reflected Sally as doing what they're doing today. So, you know, Sally would have been thinking what I was thinking and, and living in a way that I'm living. Um, so it's really hard to say what, what Sally would have been doing. I mean, um, if, you, if you listen to her friends, I think she, she still would be fighting. She probably still would have been opposed, opposed to the government. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of Sally's comrades, I mean, I can't really, you know, speak for them. I think um, some of them are still very, very politically engaged, some of them less so because, you know, they've, they've moved on in their lives, they may have, have other concerns because they're living, many of them in the diaspora, but some of them are still, you know, quite actively engaged in, in the political dynamics in Ethiopia and trying to still make movements for what they believe to be a more just and democratic society. So all spectrums, I guess. Sally and her comrades. While we were speaking, um, another question came in that sort of relates to this. You interviewed a friend of Sally, um, separate from your aunties, um, a friend that was involved in the struggle. Uh, why did you not bring them together or did you um, for an exchange? Yeah, so um, that's uh, Fakurta. Fakurta lives in, in the US. Um, and all of my aunts live in Ethiopia. So there's one, um, there's that dynamic. And then I also really made the decision to, to interview my aunts separately so that their stories, their versions of Sally, their memories of Sally weren't going to pollute each other. So that was more of a, perhaps a stylistic approach to, to shooting the film. Um, and, and that's really why they, they didn't meet during the film, uh, but they did actually meet most of them back in, in 1984 because Fakurta was one of the, the friends of Sally who went to, to my family to, to let them know that Sally had passed away. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is maybe a final question uh, right now to you. Um, maybe specifically from the angle of, of your own life experience in, in Canada or being a member of, is it fair to say of the Canadian diaspora? Would you still say that? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, how does the Ethiopian community in Canada remember, remember the difficult past of the country and how have you perceived it from there? Yeah, I mean, um, I saw that question in the chat and I don't think that the way the Ethiopian Canadian community reflects on the past is any different from the Ethiopian diaspora in Germany or in Sweden. I mean, so many people left because of the red terror um, or under the Derg regime or are still, you know, leaving, leaving today. Um, I think maybe sometimes there's, there's a disconnect in in uh, what's happening when you're living in the diaspora because you're not there. And I think that was something at least that I felt very much that, you know, I grew up in Canada. I didn't go to Ethiopia until I was in my late teens. And it was really important for me to, to move to Addis and to be there to make this film and just sort of live and breathe and, and go to the places that Sally existed in and spend time with Sally's friends who are living in Addis and spend time with my family to, to really be able to investigate and understand all of them as individuals. Um, I don't think I would have had that, that relationship or that ability to, to try and dig deeper into the context if I was doing that from Canada. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I would like to slowly, slowly wrap up here um, because it's also getting late. The, the list of questions has, um, uh, it was long, but uh, it has come to an end. Um, I'd like to close a little bit on um, with a final question to, to Fisa and also for sure, Tamara, if you would like to comment on this, um, on, the, on the prospects of um, the civic spaces, um, which, you know, a lot of the debate that we're looking at here is taking place in that context. And um, from the work that we do with, with civil society in the region, we've often had the description that this period of the draconian NGO law and the anti-terrorism law um, that were revoked under the current government um, are described often as um, a dry spell for civil society that civic actors really needed to survive and get through. And after the, the, these laws were revoked and uh, more freedoms were granted, um, there was a slow vitalization or revitalization of civil society and the media kicked in, but it's very difficult. And um, obviously this would not happen overnight and many challenges remain. Um, so I'd just like to ask uh, Fisa, if you could give us your take of how you see the civic space in Ethiopia today, uh, both in terms of the available freedoms um, and also the readiness and the capacity of civic actors to seize on these freedoms, to use them. Um, I'll start with Fisa, but I'll be happy to hear Tamara, um, Tamara's views as well, and then close after that. Mm, uh, thank you. Uh, well, we have seen a remarkable uh, uh, progress in terms of civic space after 2018, uh, but it was preceded by uh, a period uh, which was a, a extremely uh, difficult for civil society, not only for civil society, well, we can include journalism and media in civil society, but with a, with a narrow definition of civil society, uh, the formal, which is, uh, uh, we, which is considered, which is registered and whatever. Uh, but I, I, I always have a question about this, the impact of this law. Uh, the, the 2009 CSO law, because uh, the civil society in Ethiopia was extremely uh, uh, weak uh, before that law was adopted. And it was starting to bloom. And especially the human rights focused civil society was starting to come uh, and uh, the law has cut it, cut, cut them short. So there was no, there was no uh, uh, good uh, 
a strong organized civil society. And when you add that law on top of that uh, weak and disorganized civil society, the, the, even the start has uh, diminished. And so most of the uh, uh, civil society actors, uh, including the local and the internationals, were forced to leave uh, the country. Uh, and that has closed down the space uh, for organization, for leading uh, the narratives to give uh, uh, a, a reasoned uh, and an elite managed narratives in the civic space. So the change has come and now we are seeing some uh, change in terms of the civic society in Ethiopia, but still I'm seeing the same problem. One is that uh, civil society must have a constituency within, within the country. The constituency of a civil society should be the people in the country. Uh, but we don't see that kind of civil society in Ethiopia. Most of them, maybe four or five friends establishing an NGO, and maybe one man driven the others, they don't come. Maybe the uh, board will send the, the, uh, the Minute to say to to sign on things like that. So uh, this formal kind of civil society is very weak in Ethiopia, it's still budding, but it needs to adapt itself because uh, it was vulnerable in 2009 because it was disorganized. And if there is going to be any political move uh, uh, that is going to take the newly gained uh, freedom, the current civil society is not in a position to. Uh, push back and uh, fight for itself. And similarly, the media is also uh, uh, not very strong in Ethiopia. Uh, so that needs to uh, change because uh, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, uh, sticking to the journalistic uh, uh, ethics and all these things. So uh, but what we have to learn from Ethiopia history or as an Ethiopian is that these problems cannot be uh, rectified by uh, limiting the civil society or by limiting the media. It is through exercise of these freedoms they become responsible. Uh, it is through the exercise of these freedoms that they become, uh, they, they, they become uh, constituency led. Uh, instead of shutting down, limiting their space, it is giving them more space and it's opening up for the for competitions that make that would make this uh, uh, space more uh, uh, relevant for the country. Thank you very much, Tamara. I, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what what I can add to that because I think uh, Fisa has given a good sort of wide wide ranging overview. Um, but I think you know the other thing that underpins many of these these issues is sometimes capacity, and also you know the government's willingness to to do these things and to you know it's very difficult in Ethiopia to open an association. It's very very challenging to open and run um, a charity or a nonprofit. Um, and it's sometimes just those levels of, of uh, bureaucratic red tape that can also frustrate people who, who want to start these sorts of organizations and who want to do this work. Um, but when you're trying to start out and it seems like the door is closed, sometimes you maybe don't have the energy to go further. Um, and I think it's also, you know, um, space for international, international organizations and partners to help with, with best practices, with, you know, how do you structure this sort of work? How do you um, do the administrative end of these organizations and sort of the business side of, of doing this work and helping to move it forward? Because I think there's a great need for, for more public-private partnerships and for more um, organizations to, to work to work on ideas of critical thinking and, and democracy and what is the future of Ethiopia and what is, how do we all come together and, and focus on, on the collective future? I think it's all very important. Thank you. I mean, this has been a fascinating ride through film and context. I really want to thank both of you for your openness, for your readiness to engage with us here, um, our audience for staying up in some cases probably quite late. I think we've had people from around the globe. 
Um, I'm just now um, posting the link again of the short version of the film uh, that is still on the Al Jazeera website. Uh, you can find it here in the chat, uh, which um, if you have friends and uh, uh, relatives that you wish to tell, uh, that you will tell about the film and um, who might want to see uh, at least a shorter version, that might be the most accessible one right now. And Tamara has also um, provided here the link for more content around the film specifically. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for staying up uh, this late. Uh, those of you who are um, interested and continue to be interested in uh, the politics of Ethiopia, the political situation, especially the current one, uh, we as the, um, the office in Nairobi are preparing for a forum um, on the current situation, um, probably a little bit uh, from the angle of uh, the elections that uh, were postponed and how that links um, to the crisis we're in and probably also the ways that we might get out. Uh, we want to discuss these issues um, most probably on the 1st of December. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, check our website um, in, for the Kenya office. I'll just put that in here as well um, to make it easier for everyone um, where we will announce this. And um, yeah, we, we thank you for your time, for your patience with us and wish you a good night. Thank you.